behind it. Welcome to this mini episode of the Biology of Trauma podcast, The Biology Behind It. I'm your host, Dr. Amy. Today, I'm going to extract some key insights from our longer episode, 120. Yes, Biology of Trauma podcast episode number 120. And it was on why antidepressants may not be working and dive deeper into the relationship between biology, trauma, and depression. Before we begin, I want to appreciate a question that came in from Sarah. Sarah wrote to me on LinkedIn. She's a, a therapist in Seattle and says, Dr. Amy, I've actually been on an antidepressant myself, Lexapro, for the past two years. I was placed on it as I started to have symptoms of perimenopause and was struggling with some of the mood shifts. And so they put me on a low dose of Lexapro, but I'm still struggling with brain fog and feeling flat. My doctor has increased the dose, but it's not seeming to help. Is this related to stored trauma surfacing that I've been neglecting? Well, we will look at that, Lisa. So in our full episode, we explored how many mood and mental health symptoms that get diagnosed as depression, anxiety, even ADHD, have deeper roots in the nervous system in our trauma biology. And we discussed how standard treatments then, like antidepressants and medications, still might be missing the mark because they're just going to be addressing the downstream neurotransmitters and brain chemistry and not the underlying physiological patterns that are driving those changes in our biology. In the longer episode, I did walk through the five steps of how the body experiences a trauma response. And this is important to know because as we look at, is it depression or is it trauma? we're going to look at these five steps. Did the body go through these five steps? Do these five steps feel familiar to someone that they can say, yes, this is what's happening versus no, this is not relating. And it might just be a brain chemistry um, imbalance. But the five steps start with the startle. They go all the way into the shutdown. And they generate specific patterns that we can use to identify trauma. This is a big concept in my book, The Biology of Trauma, that we can identify them by patterns. As a physician, as a medical physician, this is how I was trained to diagnose other health conditions, is by patterns. Do they have these five things? And when those five things come together, well, then you know that it's likely this. This was, for example, when I was in surgery and someone came in with a gallbladder problem, we would look for the patterns of it being a gallbladder problem. Or if their appendix was swollen and infected, we were looking for the patterns. Does it fit the pattern of it being an appendicitis? And this allowed us to be strategic and deliberate in our treatment because the patterns led us to what was the root problem. So this is what happens with the body is that our body, it experiences these five steps, has a trauma response, and then it holds on to that without knowing how to reset and resolve, then it holds on. This is the section two of my book on the biology of trauma. Why does our body hold on to this past pain, fear, and overwhelm? And it forms what I call the body trauma loop. And here's what's important for you to know is that that body trauma loop is what creates the changes in our biology. One of the changes is brain inflammation. And one of the effects of brain inflammation are the imbalances in the neurotransmitters, especially things like serotonin and dopamine. And so we want to look at how are those being affected? Because as I see it, trauma biology is what is driving the mental health epidemic. Trauma biology is what's driving the mental health epidemic. And so whether we're looking at depression, anxiety, or other mental health issues, trauma biology is what is driving that mental health crisis. And, and so what we have is the five steps that I've just gone over. And here are those five steps. It starts with the startle. The body goes through these changes in its physiology. Each of these represents changes in our physiology. And if we cross this critical line of overwhelm, 
that is when ultimately we go into the shutdown response. Now the shutdown is going to be the trauma response. The freeze response and the shutdown are after we cross this critical line of overwhelm. And that is when it will create brain inflammation. Why would it create brain inflammation? Because this is our body's natural way of protecting us. If our immune system is going to protect us, then it needs to be either on guard if we're in stress or shutting down. And that's when we also get some of the other changes that we see in our immune system like autoimmunity. But right now I want to focus on that brain inflammation aspect. Brain inflammation is what will cause those symptoms of brain fog, spaciness, feeling disconnected. There's actual brain inflammation happening. And as we look at how will that impact one's mood and mental health, that brain inflammation will impact our neurotransmitters. It will directly impact our serotonin activity, our dopamine activity. And this will be some of the biology that needs to be repaired. This has already been a lot. So I just want to pause right there because as we look at the brain inflammation, we have specific repair tools. There are specific immune cells in our brain. These are called microglia. They are specialized immune cells in our brain, and they normally are protecting our brain and specifically our neurons. They're the ones that are pruning. So they are needed for neuroplasticity. Anytime that we want to wire in a new, a new habit, well, we need these microglia to help with that neuroplasticity. But when our body experiences such overwhelm and such a level of terror, panic, overwhelm, shutdown, that is when the microglia will also unleash an enormous amount of inflammation. This is done through cytokines, these different chemicals that attract more inflammatory cells. Now, this is done to be protective, but in the meantime, a lot of bystanders get damaged, and those bystanders, innocent bystanders, would be our neurons. And now they're surrounded by this inflammation. And the first time that this happens, we call that priming. But once they're primed, now they're more sensitive. And we can have these triggers of our microglia when we don't sleep well or when we are traveling and exposed to more radiation or oxidative stress. They can be triggered by an emotional overwhelm where we again are in that situation or having the internal experience of feeling trapped, of feeling powerless. We don't know what to do. We feel all alone. We can't believe what's happening. And as our body goes into a trauma response again, then those cells get activated once more and they get into this habit of unleashing inflammation. There are also there's also evidence that when those uh, microglia get activated by other non-emotional reasons, say for example, we didn't sleep well, and maybe it's been a few nights that we haven't slept well, and we wake up and we feel that brain fog, we feel that decision fatigue, we feel that our brain has shut off to some degree, we feel flat, everything feels hard. That is our brain in this inflammation, and that can be triggered by non-emotional triggers. So it can be what we ate. If we have food sensitivities, if we have gut imbalance, that will also trigger these immune cells. And so the end result will feel the same. We will still feel overwhelmed. We will still feel like we want to curl up into a ball. We will still feel what it feels like to be in that shutdown trauma response, but it will not have been from something emotional. It will have actually been from our environment or our lifestyle or something else that has triggered that. But here's what's fascinating. Research has consistently shown that those with depression, anxiety, even PTSD have elevated inflammatory markers in their blood, in their bloodstream, and that the imbalances in the neurotransmitters, the brain chemistry, the serotonin, the dopamine, and the GABA, these get imbalanced more with inflammation in the brain. So let's take the example that uh, Lisa wrote in, or even my example of I've been on antidepressants. It's not going to take away the brain inflammation. 
And there's only so much that an antidepressant can do then because it's trying to increase the activity of a certain neurotransmitter. Many antidepressants work on serotonin. Some of them work on serotonin and dopamine, but they're trying to increase the level of these neurotransmitters without actually addressing why the imbalance. They're not getting to the inflammation. And that is why the research is showing, my goodness, only 50% of people who go on an antidepressant, it actually helps them. They actually are experiencing relief of their symptoms. 50%, that means when you go in and they're offering you an antidepressant, it's 50-50 whether it's going to help you. And that tells me that we're not addressing the root cause. That's not the real root cause if it's only 50-50. So how is this connected then with trauma? Knowing that the inflammation and the trauma response are so closely connected. Anytime that I'm looking at someone, not only with symptoms of depression, but also of anxiety, I'm looking at, do I see the other patterns of trauma showing up in their life? Because whether this biology was triggered by something emotional or it was triggered by something like food sensitivity that caused the brain inflammation, the end result is still the same. The nervous system is getting overwhelmed and it's going into shutdown and that person will feel depressed. A shutdown response is a response where we feel depressed. And so a lot of trauma, stored trauma in the body, does get a diagnosis of depression because it also looks like these other things. It also looks like anhedonia, a fancy word for saying, I've lost interest in the things that used to interest me. I don't care about doing those things that brought me meaning, that brought me joy before. And so this is a really important concept of the biology of trauma, is that our own biology keeps us stuck in these trauma responses. Our own biology keeps us stuck. And as we look at what will need to be repaired then, what will need to be repaired is some of this brain inflammation. Because if we have the brain inflammation being triggered by other things, it will continue to put us into a trauma response and it will take our energy, preventing us from actually having the energy to rewire our brain and our nervous system and our body for something like safety. And so some of the repair that will need to be done is repairing the fact that we may have too little serotonin, the fact that we may have too little dopamine, the fact that we may have too little GABA. And we will need to repair the biology that we have too much glutamate. This is what happens when we have brain inflammation. Glutamate gets increased. But if we have too much glutamate from other reasons, that will cause brain inflammation. Adrenaline. Adrenaline is another, well, it's, it is a neurotransmitter. You probably know it more of a stress hormone, right? When we're stressed, we release adrenaline to help give us energy and to take action. But too much adrenaline will also cause that brain inflammation. And so really what we're looking at is that when someone gets placed on an antidepressant, whether that's for symptoms of anxiety or symptoms of depression, the medication is intending to increase the certain activity of a brain chemical, of a neurotransmitter. But that won't be enough. Because if we have the low activity because of brain inflammation, that brain inflammation will still be creating all of the other downstream effects, including putting our body into a trauma response. Brain inflammation will overwhelm our nervous system and tell our nervous system, it'll be cues of danger for our nervous system, if you're familiar with terms of the polyvagal theory cues of danger that say we are in an inescapable life threat surrounded by all this inflammation. And it won't matter that we're, that we are on an antidepressant because our body will then shift into that survival protective mode of shutting down. Brain inflammation has been a game changer for me personally. I was stuck. I was stuck with brain fog and decision fatigue, feeling like I had no energy then for even 
following through on a lot of the therapy that I was paying for because my brain just couldn't keep up. And when I learned that I had brain inflammation and I started taking the different supplements, started changing my sleep environment so that my brain could clear that stuff out while I was sleeping and was able to do these other changes in order to help decrease the inflammation, that's what changed my life. So Lisa, I'm going to come back to your question and answer that. I will say that if you are interested in more around this topic of how our own biology creates a trauma response, you will want a copy of my book and you can pre-order that now. And the link is in the show notes. I will also put a link in the show notes to my personal brain inflammation supplement protocol. So you can see what I take to calm down that fire and allow my brain to not be uh, surrounded by inflammation, but be able to create safety around my neurons so that I can have the energy to do things like create positive change in my life. Let's come back to your question, Lisa, because this is a fantastic question that you asked. Your symptoms of anxiety, depression, feeling flat, brain fog, now it can make more sense that if we have these patterns that tell us that this is something more than just a single neurotransmitter imbalance, it sounds like these are patterns of brain inflammation which is good news in my book. This is good news because now we can know what to do. Now we can be strategic and deliberate in knowing I have brain inflammation. Let me take the supplements. Let me make the changes in my life that will decrease that inflammation. And then it's possible that the antidepressant will uh, work better for you, but it's also possible that you'll find that you don't need an antidepressant. I was able to get off of the two antidepressants that I had been started on. And you're asking then, is this stored trauma in my body? And the short answer is, yes, it's causing a trauma response. And that trauma response has created trauma patterns and has become then stored trauma in the body. But we we want to first be able to look at, well, what's driving this? And it sounds like brain inflammation is what's driving the ongoing persistent trauma response of shutdown, shutdown with the brain fog and the decision fatigue. And what I share, what I teach on is that idea that the trauma response is when things happen too much too fast or too little for too long. And this is what happens with brain inflammation. It creates too much inflammation too fast but also creates imbalances that are then too little for too long, too little serotonin, too little energy for just too long. So I would suggest, Lisa, that you start with the anti-inflammatory strategies. You can start taking uh, an omega-3 rich foods like wild caught salmon is a great idea. You can also do a high quality fish oil supplement. You want to increase omega-3s. You do need to optimize your sleep environment. I understand that sleep can sometimes be challenging. I'm not talking about, oh, just go sleep better. I'm saying optimize your sleep environment. Make your room very dark. Use blackout curtains. Make it cool. Put your bed at a slight angle or position pillow so that you're sleeping at a slight angle so that all of that lymphatic drainage can come out of your brain and your brain can do the cleanup that it needs to do while you are sleeping so you can actually get better rest and thus have a better brain when you wake up. And please check out the supplement protocol for brain inflammation where you can see the other specific targeted supplements that I take for that brain inflammation, even a specific form of magnesium that targets neurons more than any other tissue. With that, thank you, Lisa. I wish you the best. And I hope that you will begin to feel the difference as you start to address the inflammation that it sounds like is driving not only some of the symptoms, but then the ineffectiveness of the antidepressant. I'm your host, Dr. Amy, and I will see you next time.